Well, welcome to this second talk. So the, the second Bojanga, Dhamma Vichaya, is uh, usually translated as investigation of Dhammas, which you all, I'm sure you all know. And Dhammas seems to cover just about everything. Um, I suppose basically Dhammas means anything that we experience in, in our lives that impacts on us. And the, the day for Dhamma Vichara is Tuesday. And the associated Buddha position, the associated Buddha Rupa, is the Buddha, the reclining Buddha. And I'll show you a couple of um, pictures. You know, the most beautiful Buddha, reclining Buddhas in, um, in Thailand that I've seen anywhere are in caves. So there are two examples. One is in Angna not far from Phuket. It's a very well-known uh, cave temple. If you ever visit uh, Phuket and you want to do a trip up to Pangna, one or two of you may already have done this. Anyone you ask will tell you where Wat Tam cave temple is, Wat Tam. And this is the, you can see the entrance, the stairs on the top right. And this rupa is about 50 feet long. Um, the age? No one seems to really know, but I don't think it's terribly ancient. The, the, the style of the head is um, maybe in the last uh, century, maybe a bit more. On the other hand, it could have been, it could have been renovated, and who, who knows just how old it is. This one is um, right in the south of Thailand, Surat Thani province, and is much older. Um, this cave temple, it's been studied quite a lot um, archaeologically. It belongs to the Sivijaya period in Thailand, so it's at least the, the being used for over a thousand years as, um, as a temple or a living space for, um, for monks. So the, the Buddha here is believed to be very old. Um, some say originally more than a thousand years old. But there's undoubtedly, as always, there always is in these kind of constructed, large constructed images, a lot of renovation because inside this, so there's a you know there's a whole structure of, of bricks and um, uh, things holding it together and plaster. But it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful room. But the face is is um, it's, it's just beautiful. So. This, this position is the position of the Buddha in Parinirvana um, after his enlightenment. So which is a pretty strong clue that Dhamma Vichaya is to do with wisdom. The day Tuesday is associated with, with Dhamma Vichaya. So according to the tr tradition, if you were born on a Tuesday, you might have a, a kind of affinity to Dhamma Vichaya. You may be you know, maybe a very thoughtful person. Um, you may have a natural kind of insight, insight where you, you don't jump to conclusions, you, you process things carefully. On the other hand, you might think, if you think about it, you may think you, you've got um, very far from that, that you jump to conclusions too quickly, you get caught up in sidetrack, sidetracks. But anyway, even then you can see Dhamma Vichaya for you if you're born on a Tuesday as a reminder um, that maybe it's something you can really benefit from working on. Dhamma Vichaya is often described as the, the investigation side of it. It's often described as um, discriminating between wholesome and unwholesome states, um, good and bad states, blameful and blameless states. Um, a bit like the sort of things we talk about sometimes in uh, Dhamma discussion groups. Or you can be reading and working the same kind of issues out yourself, thinking about is it this or is it that? Um, what does it really mean? So that, that's the starting point. It's a bit like the, you know, the starting point in Sati that I mentioned last time, 
the very basic starting point is just simply placing attention on, on the number in the breath or on a casino um, object. But it's a starting point. And so the starting point, thinking in, about the meaning of Dhamma Vichaya, as I just described it, is, is okay. It's in practice, when you come to sit in meditation, is, is not useful anymore. You can set a direction before, but you have to remember that anything that's to do with is it this or that, comparing states, wholesome, unwholesome, good or bad, that's the very typical nature of default consciousness, of sensory consciousness. That's how we process everything in our lives. But the task in Bhojangas, developing the Bhojangas and the jhanas, is to turn away, disengage from that way of thinking. So in, in practice, it's less to do with that kind of cognitive process, and much more to do with a way of attending, a way of a way of seeing. It's based on um, you could say curiosity, but it it's not a passive curiosity. There has to be a kind of motivation. And the, the motivation is, is ultimately to understand, you know, towards truth. In a way that's more direct than, is it this or is it that? So the sati, when we talked about it last week, is very important in the very beginning of the practice, the counting. And vichara becomes very important in the, in the following. We have to feel what we're doing, uh, whereas Fitaka, the counting is, is one, two, three. But to keep mindfulness going, there has to be a feeling quality. And that's the basis of recognition, understanding that quality. When I was thinking about this talk yesterday, I, was, I remembered a class with Naibuman in the first year, probably about this stage actually, halfway through the first year. So he would have been talking about um, counting and following. I'm not quite sure, it's not a clear memory. And during this talk, he asked the group, um, out of the blue, is it possible to know right from wrong? Now this is a this is a group where you you can picture a group of um, undergraduates and postgraduate students in Cambridge. So of course, animated discussion, you know, around and around and around and around and around. That phrase you sometimes come across in um, Abhidhamma about a net of views, you know, it captures it pretty well. Bowman didn't take didn't join in. He was interested, but he quietly listened until it eventually ran its course. Now, why did that question come to him to ask that question at that time, but that to that group? And why did it stick in my mind for more than 50 years, very clearly? I don't remember the context so well, the exact time, but I remember the question very clearly and the feeling in the question very clearly. And the struggle that the group had with the question very clearly. And why did it occur to me yesterday thinking about talking about Dhamma Vichaya? And I understand much better looking back than I did at the time how Nai um operated. He occasionally came up with these um, out of the blue enigmatic comments and it was difficult to know quite where they came from but they always stuck in your mind which is which is very intriguing um, and I think it's because it comes from a place which is to do with the path and anyone who has some connection with the path, even if, you, if it's an early stage, something like that can come up if it's appropriate to the group. And it's almost like the, the path will show itself 
somehow. And later in his teaching, Nai Bhuman, I think, is much more conscious of this, you know, the way he operates in Dhamma discussion groups. But raising something like that, the reason it sticks in people's mind is because it, it touches on something very, very deep, quite profound, that's somewhere there latently in, in all of us, it seems to me, and it's to do with uh, an urge to understand, an urge towards meaning and an urge towards truth. So that I think is very appropriate to where we're at in this second talk. You know, the first factor, sati, we have to start somewhere and it's a very basic function. We're talking about the book, the Dhamma Vichaya, as starting in a very basic way. But once you start, you know, even though it's very basic to begin with, it's almost like the, the end is in, in the background. Once you start, there's a potential completion. So this is a whole beginning of, of setting out on, on a path. I want to go back to the, what goes on in the brain. So this is the same, the, similar to the picture I showed last time, but it's now complete. Last time with Sati, I was talking about the, the dorsal stream, which is a very basic attention stream, well known, at least in the last 15 years, in neuroscience. It goes from the back of the head, the visual cortex, around the top of the head, the dorsal areas, through the associative parietal cortex to the frontal lobe, which is all, all to do with cognitive processing, um, etc. Now this dorsal stream is quick, it's fast, it doesn't need long-term storage, it just is like you are bang, 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 placing your attention on one, two, three, or whatever the object is. Now the, the second stream is called the ventral stream, which also starts at the back of the head and it also ends in the frontal cortex, but it goes by a different path, it goes through the temporal lobe, it goes through, um, it's got a lot of connection to the core regions of the brain. And all these regions, the core regions and the temporal lobe, they include functions like uh, memory, uh, feeling, emotion. Um, so they establish recognition by comparing to long-term memory, previous experience, they establish recognition, salience, um, and meaning. These arrows, by the way, don't go in this direction on the diagram, but of course there's, there's a reciprocal pathway too. It's interactive. There's always an interaction between subject, between subject and object. The object may change, the subject changes, and so on. So these two pathways, now we have both together to think about. The, compar the, the comparison or the association is to the two functions of um, Injana Vitaka for the dorsal stream and Vikshara where we establish meaning and salience to the ventral stream. In terms of the, the Bhujangas, the dorsal stream corresponds very well to Sati and the ventral stream to meaning, Dhamma Vikshaya. What is extraordinary to me, you know, when I started this brain study, looking at the activity in the brain, no idea, nothing to compare it to because no one had ever studied jhana meditation before. And to find that, you know, two things we're familiar with in, in Buddhism, um, the description of jhana, vitaka, vichara, you know, a tradition that goes back two and a half thousand years. And then to see how in neuroscience, they correspond to two streams, attention streams in neuroscience that have been known for probably about 15 years. I find it absolutely extraordinary, you know, that you can get this sort of ancient tradition derived from basically a wish to understand 
how we work, how our mind works, how we get attached, how we suffer, how we can disengage from that, how all that introspective quest through meditation has its counterpart in understandings like what we just talked about in neuroscience. Now, those two streams in neuroscience, you could say that they, they're like the backbone of sensory consciousness. All of our sensory consciousness of, of paying attention to some input, whether it's from seeing or hearing or touching, uh, involves a subject thinking about an idea or an object. And those networks are active all the time in everyday life in the background. And the, the characteristic of that kind of network, every network in the brain has a time scale. And for that sensory consciousness network, it has a time scale which is quite quick, um, basically around about 100 milliseconds, which is the time it takes for us to process uh, uh, an input, something we see or something happens, to process it partly unconsciously, very quickly, eventually to then act on it. It's like the reaction time, 100 milliseconds is the typical reaction time for all of us. So it's also, you could think, of almost like a minimum duration of a thought. Not a very sophisticated thought because it's just reactive. You need a series of thought moments like that to be able to process and understand something. But that time scale factor, 100 milliseconds, is the signature of that form of consciousness. And you see it in the correspondence to 100 milliseconds is 10 cycles a second in frequency, 10 hertz. And that's called the alpha rhythm. And anyone who closes their eyes, and if you were looking at the EEG, you would find that um, the back of the head, again the subject area, shows an alpha rhythm around 10 cycles a second, a bit random, a bit erratic, but it's always there to some degree. And if you're very, very relaxed and comfortable, it's quite strong. If you're a bit anxious, it's not, it's not so strong, but everyone has it. Think then about when we practice meditation, we develop Vitaka Vichara. It's necessary for a meditator to disengage from that sensory consciousness, which means disengaging from the, those two pathways. And what we find is the alpha rhythm changes. Now the, the alpha rhythm at the back of the head is known to change and get disrupted when we're about to fall asleep, um, when we're about to be anesthetized in hospital, um, it breaks down. And it gives way to little bursts of alpha activity, almost like wave packets, I'll show you in a minute. They're called spindles. So in neuroscience, spindles occur in the approach to sleep, they occur in early stages of being anesthetized, and they occur also in something called attentional attention distraction, even when you're not tired. So if you're driving a car, and amazingly, research has been done on this by uh, BMW and Daimler. They studied drivers when you're trying to pay attention to the road and the traffic, and someone's talking to you or chattering away in the back or alongside. And you notice in the, in the EEG, you get spindles developing at the back of the head, even though the, the driver's not tired or sleepy. So there's a big clue here, because when you look at meditators, out of the about 30 meditators that were recorded, the majority, I think from memory, 25 or 26 showed spindles to some degree. Maybe more, maybe they all did, because two or three records were not absolutely um, perfect, technically. So I'm going to show some examples of this, just to show you what, what is actually going on when you're paying attention to the counting and the following 
Um, you may think nothing much is going on. You may be frustrated that you're not making much progress, but believe me, a lot's going on quickly. This is what happens when someone's recorded, in case any of you haven't seen it, most of you have, is a head cap with, in this case, 31 electrodes, and they're all at fixed positions on the head, which are these positions. They're all labeled F for front claw, O for the posterior occipital, temporal C, central C, frontal F. Okay, so now the, the top traces, these are the electrode labels at the left. The top traces are at the front, and the ones at the back are ahead of the back. This is someone who is asked to just close his eyes, or her eyes, I can't remember who it was, and just rest without meditating. And you can see this rhythm at the back of the head uh, is very strong in this case, because actually this person's on the edge of meditating. And the time scale, one second is, is about an inch on the screen. So if you count, if you count the rhythms between um, one second interval, you find there are about 10. There's 10 hertz. This is the alpha rhythm. And it's, it's more or less um, always there to some degree. It's a bit erratic, but you can see, this, you can see the beginning this person, and there are periods of, of silence where there's nothing much going on, and maybe he's thinking, and then it comes back, and there's the beginnings of spindles, but this is fairly normal, eyes closed. Someone who is uh, developing their meditation quite well would be an example like this, where You can see these little bursts are more clearly defined now. Like, you know, they, they're like a little wave packet. They're very, very, very minimal, they increase in amplitude, then it fades away. And it lasts about a second or less than a second. So this, this is the, how the spindles develop for a meditator when, they, when you're working on Pitaka and Vichara. So this is quite strong now. This is someone who's actually meditating, developing the early stages of trying to approach jhana. And to give you an example, which is really further along, this is someone who is um, almost dominated the EG by spindles. And they're just beautiful. Um, you never see them as beautiful or well-formed as this in, in sleep or anesthesia. But this is, this is meditation and is what we found that develops um, for a meditator. They come in bursts and then there's a period of silence in between. And the, the silence, if this person carries on longer, the silences get, um, get more developed too. So, if you look at another way of looking at this in the brain, I'll show you very quickly. Um, we take a time section, this yellow bar, and we work out what the actual activity is across the head. Each of these is a plot of the head from the top. On the left, the delta is very slow waves, theta is sort of intermediate. This is the alpha rhythm at the back of the head. So you can see that's the dominant rhythm. Beta is a normal thinking rhythm, a bit faster than alpha. Everything else has gone more or less in comparison quiet. Yellow is the most intense, then red. Black is sort of neutral, and then it becomes very weak. So it's not just that the alpha rhythm is very strong at the back of the head for a meditator. All the front of the head, the cognitive functioning, has become damped down to the point where there's hardly any thinking. This is what goes on when someone is um, developing Vitaka and Vichara. So, one of the real benefits of, of showing someone, a medita meditator, that th this is happening, um, for some people, it's a kind of revelation, you know, that it isn't all hard work and no, um, no apparent 
changes, making really, really very clear, very strong changes in the in the in the brain. So I think time to do a bit of practice. Okay, so we're going to do some practice for about 15, 20 minutes, and I'll sound the bell at the beginning and the end. And I'm not going to give detailed instructions, just do your own practice. But one thing to uh, think about, Vitakra and Vichara, what I was saying about being a starting point. Vitakra and Vichara are the, take you to the very threshold of jhana, which means they take you to the very threshold of letting go of sensual consciousness. It, it's no longer at some point an effort to resist thinking. It becomes more content where you are. Less urge to, to do anything. And again, it reminds me of another, another um, Boomman connection. I mentioned just the one about the um, can you tell right from wrong. Sometimes you ask your meditation group, you might ask your meditation group, and I'm, I'm raising it here, I'm asking you now, what, what is the reason you're doing meditation? You know, why are you doing meditation? And again, like the, the group in Cambridge, when you're not terribly experienced, that can go anywhere. There's no end to the reasons that you can concoct why you're doing this. I want to be happy, I want to be more peaceful, I want psychic power, whatever. But when you're more experienced, if I ask you this now, on the basis of having established a certain amount of Vitaka and Vichara, a certain amount of Sati with Dhamma Vichaya, why, where are you going? What is it you want? Why are you practicing meditation? And sometimes it stops you dead. There's no answer through the kind of cognitive processing. They, they miss the point. So at this point when you're on the threshold of connecting or disengaging towards jhana, and in the practice we do, you know, if you let go, and don't try to control things too much, but there's, so there's this deep, deep question towards somewhere towards meaning and truth. You don't have to worry too much about which jhana or stages. Let it deepen, deepen, deepen. So each time we practice, like last week and now this week, in a way, we're building something around the bhajangas and jhana where no matter whether it starts at the beginning, there's already a completion in, in potential. Have a comfortable seat and sound the bell. The first strike of the bell hits you, breaks your stream of consciousness, and that's the attacker. As you hear the bell reverberating, as long as my microphone doesn't shut it down, um, if you hear the reverberation and you just allow it to continue and then fade out and just stay with it, then that's Vichara, or it gives you a feeling of Vitakra and Vichara. And I'll sound the bell at the end. And when you hear the second bell, Stay with the feeling for a few moments before you open your eyes. And we'll see what comes down to that.
normally what we do after a, a practice like this is you come out of a still point and out of that stillness if something occurs to you that you want to um, share with the group please do so and there's no need for anyone to respond uh, and then if someone else wants to say something the same thing no no need to respond uh, if a third person says something maybe um, you might see a theme or something occurs which you think is useful as a response and that's fine cool. there does seem to be um, some subtle investigating in the practice um, which is useful um, sometimes it's sort of thinking for a moment is this the right moment to change stage and um, or <coughs> sometimes almost thinking what for a moment what more needs to be done or what needs to be done to to keep to sustain a particular sort of attention perhaps very momentary can say something. Um, I found the image of the reclining Buddha very helpful. Um, when I first saw it, I thought, you know, our, our, our translation of investigation is um, there's sort of an ac activity associated with that. But my understanding is that's not really what it's about. That that sort of that image of that very relaxed alertness just seemed to be very helpful mm. it was kind of watching watching without thinking experience you know the senses were conscious and aware but but there was no association of thinking. Yes, I, I think that's interesting as well. That there's a there seems a form of um, of the Dhamma Vichaya, um, which is almost not to do with um, thinking in the normal way. It's almost as though you you bring something to mind and then just see what comes but there is there is something that's happening clearly which is very subtle but it's not it's almost like the not thinking or the not consciously thinking allows the the answer to come at some point uh, i was uh, I entered a dream state, um, but then I was aware I was in a dream state, so I was able to say dream state and bring the attention back to gaze. I, I, I found the, <coughs> the, the image of the, um, the brain waves and the, um, the kind of packets of activity in them different activities that are kind of happening. Um, I don't know, that's a, um, <clears throat> somehow in the practice, um, uh, that image kind of um, allowed me to kind of see the kind of mind kind of changing and moving around and kind of thoughts coming, um, but then not to, um, not to kind of worry about it somehow, not to kind of fight it. Uh, and then just to kind of things just kind of coming and then going um, with a kind of I don't know a kind of knowing there's a kind of knowingness behind that coming and going um, 
I would say it seems that as you go deeper into the practice and settling, there can be some investigation which is doesn't really involve Vitaka Vichara mm. or natural and unfolding. But Vitaka and Vichara, although they're normally involved in thinking, in practice, it's kind of on the edge of thinking. <laughs> It's a subtler form of that, those mental processes, then, then one can kind of let go of those as well. Um, something that I noticed is it's um, harder to make decisions in the practice than it is in normal life. And I think that maybe ties in a bit with that slightly dream state. It can fall into a dream state or it can go into something which is kind of deeper than being able to make quick decisions so there's a feeling of being kind of um carried along by the mind but a bit less in control which is sort of good and bad i think <laughs> can be good but can drift into slightly out of control more dreamy kind of states and you were going to say something y yes um it was about subject object and that image of of the um what's going on in the practice i wondered what when subject object come together so if you're looking at it from the point of view of of those moments of unification that when things come into a certain balance. I wondered if that is the space in that graphic representation or whether that's the spindle. Yes, I mean, we've come to a point where it's right on, on the kind of threshold of, of changing into a different form of consciousness. And so when we, when we next me talking about we'll be talking more about jhana um, vitaka and vichara are being established and when you ask about the the spin laws and the space all that activity around those frequencies um, fades away and instead of a front back subject object what emerges is a, is a vertical axis where the meditator is feeling um, fully conscious but not conscious of anything like this or that and this is why the word uh, presence um, I think is probably the closest you can come to this fully aware which develops progressively from, I mean, the first Rupa Jhana is, the, is still very near to thinking Vitaka and Vichara. And so you can sometimes, it could sometimes intrude a little bit in this a very quick, it may be very fleeting kind of uh, recollection of where you are and a thought of what to do. It can be very, very subtle, but it can still be on that level of, um, the edge of sensory consciousness. But once it gets established, all the spindles, all those frequencies disappear. And everything slows right down. Slows so far down in, into um, a different time factor entirely. Instead of, instead of 100 milliseconds, in jhana, it's much more like, because you get very strong, powerful slow waves developing. And the time scale for those is something like 10 or 20 seconds, sometimes even 30 or 40. And so for the meditator, increasingly you feel time is almost irrelevant. Uh, and in correspondence to that is space, the two go together. You know, when we talked about setting up uh, mindfulness, it, it creates a moment in time and space. So they're always interchanged. I mean, if you want to go back to 
the physics behind it, you know, quantum theory, the time and space are in, in, intimately connected. If you pin one down, the other becomes unbounded, which is a bit like change from Rupa to Arupa. So the time scale in, in jhana becomes so long, you feel that it's endless and that uh, you're just perfectly balanced in, in that kind of new consciousness. The interesting thing is the, the theme of what you're talking about, several of you are talking about, is this awareness that there can be a subtle kind of um, Vitaka, not Vitaka, sorry, Dhamma Vichaya. There can be a subtle kind of knowing. And it's a knowing which you get more and more familiar with. Um, it takes a little, it, it's necessary to get familiar with it by doing it. As Nagruman would say, um, get used to with it. Not, not get used to it, just get used to with it, doing it, and then you know what, what the difference is. So it's a, it's a different kind of perception of knowing. Ultimately, um, what we're talking about are moments where the, everything can become very unified and still and absorbed. And it appears that nothing intrudes on the stillness and the um, presence. But it's not the case that the, the state is, is, is kind of lost for an hour or two hours. If it's properly developed, <coughs> which is a gradual path, if it's properly developed and someone has withdrawn from sensory consciousness steadily, 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 rather than suppressing it, because if you suppress it, which is possible, it's always there just nearby, ready to emerge. But if you withdraw very, very gradually until nothing is left of it, and there is no uh, effort in, in maintaining that state, not even what Francis was saying. So we're talking about something developing to the point of like the third and fourth of the jhana. It can become so present and still, but yet there is still, it seems to me, you have to test this for yourself ultimately. There is still a kind of process of um, wisdom in it. It's, it's as though the samatha and the bhasana are both there. Of course, if you're in that state and, and someone, something, there's a demand on you, which can happen, you know, if you're living an ordinary life, sometimes uh, someone intrudes or a noise happens, then you're immediately out. And if it's been developed properly with no disturbance. So it's not the case that you drop into something and you're lost in it, that everything becomes a kind of um, blankness or emptiness with no awareness at all. That may be so, something like that in the ninth state, which is talked about a cessation of consciousness, but all the jhanas, including the Arupa jhanas, there is still consciousness. You know, the getting used to with it is a really lovely phrase that Nagruman uses. I'm not sure he really consciously uh, is aware, but it's one of those instinctive things, the way he talks about things. You get used to with something, but you're in it. And there's no separation from it. So in increasingly as you approach, John, you're getting used to being with something without interfering with it. The only, the last thing I will say about it is the quality of mindfulness to keep that going. Um, because in different, very, very subtle, subtle ways, including the one that you mentioned, Debbie, Deborah, the, um, the kind of slightly dream, dreamy state that comes in is often a sign that it's, it's drifted a bit. So 
the awareness of the breath is, is very interesting. How long does that stay with us? Um, not to let it go too quickly. And it doesn't mean you, you, are, you are very conscious of your breath. You know, if you're practicing samatha and it gets deeper and deeper, the breath gets more and more subtle. You don't have to uh, do anything particular. It, it will just become part of the stillness. But still there can be mindfulness there right, right up to the point of uh, complete absorption. So don't be in a haste to drop into something. The idea of dropping into something has been kind of um, used quite often and it, it can be very confusing. Um, Francis? Paul, I, I wasn't quite sure if I heard, but did you say that the mindfulness can be present right up to the point of um, deep absorption? It's, it's actually there in absorption. You know, you know, in the Buddhist, it eventually becomes, I think, what is talked about in the Eightfold Path of Samma Samadhi and Samma Sati. It's a kind of all-encompassing part of the state. The presence, if you think of the third Rupa Jhana, for example, it's often described in the um, commentaries that the meditator, for the first time, knows that they are fully conscious, that nothing is left out. And so the mindfulness at that point, you can get a, get a sense even describing it in that way. The mindfulness is, is, is almost all encompassing. <laughs> um, and then, but that's still not necessarily fully developed to the point of samma sati. But yeah, mindfulness is part of the being conscious. I guess one of the one of the one of the kind of things to um, note from this, particularly from the, you know in what goes on in your own meditation and then in the brain, <coughs> is it really it really makes the point that the establishing vitaka and vichara is is something not to be rushed is is so um, fundamental. And the way we do it in this, you know, in this um, method that Nibuman taught, is is a is a gradual path, um, very patient, gradual path through, through counting, following, touching, settling, which is equivalent. If you, it's equivalent in the Anapanasati Sutta to mindfulness and body, feelings, um, mind, and mind objects, dhammas. So it's a very slow, gradual process. It is possible to, to, to rush it. Um, it is possible to suppress the hindrances. But that's not really what we, we're doing. <clears throat> Francis, you look interested. You like to suppress the hindrances? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Avoid them, suppress them. <laughs> It's, uh, it's useful for me. For me, I, I mean, I, I agree. Ultimately, you 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 um, wish to be free of them, mm. but um, in the meantime, anything that makes them less <laughs> seems good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that there's almost developed, you know, in the time that. A lot of the Samatha practices were lost in Thailand and Cambodia from the 1950s. Um, what's emerged as genres come back a bit is uh, in some cases an assumption that you have to sit for an hour or more, um, almost at all costs to, 
to that point where eventually they'll they'll be exhausted or they or or you, you transcend them in some way but that may be okay that may be the the way for some people i don't know um what i think can happen though is that if you do suppress them and you come to the point where um, vitaka and vichara are established and you have kind of suppress the hindrances you come right up to the point of ready for jhana, the threshold of jhana, and may experience the first of jhana. But if, the, if they've been suppressed and they're so nearby, there can be a, a moment where you want to reflect on what you've done. And you, you, at that point, either you can come back into sensory consciousness, reflect on it and go back in, but actually it's also a risk that you, at that point, you're very close to a deep, dreamless sleep. And it's possible to come out of the first of Vajana and drop into the Vanga, the mistake of Vajana. So the gradual path is, is all, you know, it's fine in the long run, but sometimes you have to learn about the, the kind of back alleys, the dead ends. <laughs> And they're not really dead ends. I think it's all to do with getting familiar with, you know, what all the possibilities are. So, is that enough for today? What is it? Half 11, I think it probably is. And, um, we'll talk a bit more about the next two factors, Virya and PT. Maybe talk about them together, actually. Okay. So go and enjoy a cup of tea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 สัมมาทุเปกะโพชังคามสัตเตเตสัพพะทัสสินะโมนินา